things like evidence started to emerge. Um, bodies were found. Was it an accident? Was it a crime? How long they had been there? And it was kind of this question of like these mysteries that are existing around us that we don't even know about. Welcome to our latest book reporter talks to interview where our guest today is Megan Miranda. It's been a long time. Wow. She's been a big, we've talked to her more than once. And we're going to talk to her today about her latest thriller, Daughter of Mine, which is a book reporter bets on selection. I love this book, the twists, the turns. As I'm interviewing Megan a week before our book review, um, review comes out, I'm going to share a quote of a starred review from Kirkus which says, Miranda, a consummate professional when it comes to exposing the small community tensions that naturally arise when people live in close proximity for generations, exposes revelation after twisty revelation. <laughs> small town claustrophobia and intimacies alike propel this twist-filled psychological thriller. Okay, we can just sign off now. That's enough. No, thank you. And with that intro, welcome, Megan. Good to see you. Yes, thank you so much. It's always so fun to chat with you. Well, with that that prelude, how about if you tell us about Daughters of Mine so I don't spoil anything? You know? Yeah, it's always so hard with thrillers, right? Where you're mm -hmm. like, how much can I talk about before <laughs> the twists start coming? Um, so yeah, Daughter of Mine is about a woman named Hazel who unexpectedly inherits her childhood home, and she's draw drawn back to the small town where she grew up, and as she returns, a drought has also descended on the region, and the lake level drops behind her house, and long-buried secrets begin to emerge, and it's really about secrets that happen in the town, but also a family, and I feel like it's a story that's really about family, the different types of family at the core. It's like chosen family, found family, family you're born into, family that chooses you, um, people that you work with, people that you've been friends with for life. So it was really fun to kind of explore all of those layers and then put it into this world of a thriller as well. Yeah. And it's definitely a thriller, folks. <laughs> you know, you've told me in the past that you don't outline books. You don't know how they're going to end. Yeah. Was that the same with this book or have you changed? No, I still, okay, so I don't outline, but I feel like I, I do it as I go. So I'm just somebody who can't do it beforehand. Mm -hmm. I really have to dive in and get to know my characters that way. But I do have on my computer as I'm writing, I have my document that I'm writing in. And then beside it, I have a big Excel spreadsheet. And I use that to kind of create like a backbone of the structure. And once I know that, I feel like that allows me to have like, a guide right. that at least I'm not just, you know, I, I see where I'm putting certain things. And so I fill it in as I'm going with clues I've discovered, what's happened. Um, and then it, it helps like it. So it develops as I go. Right. And I can kind of see things coming, but it's never before I start. And I never know the ending um, until I'm considerably in usually in story which is so interesting but I can see you going clue over here drop yeah. this one down there oh that's a good one hold that for later oh move that one up you know or like what what is this going to become hopefully we'll find out later <laughs> <laughs> or nothing maybe go back right. later you know? yes yes you know each chapter notes at the top the number of days without rain because that's a big problem and mm -hmm. the time of day and the precipitation prediction did you write those as you went or did you know at the beginning, like this is the great setup on this because it's going to you know, pull up the tension even more. It's not going to rain today either. Something's not going to happen. I did not. So that was something that developed after my first draft. Um, what I had in mind for the structure of the story was there from the beginning. When I first talked about this idea, um, I knew I wanted to, to structure it in parts where it starts part one, father part two mother, the story is still moving forward, but it's kind of going into the things that happened with different family members. Um, and it was after I had turned in my first draft and I was talking to my brilliant editor and my brilliant agent. And we were talking about like, you know, how we're going to talk about this drought, how we're going to, you know, set up the different days and, and really have that impact. Um, and that's when that idea came about of like using the drought because it's such an important part of the story. Um, and it almost becomes a ticking clock. It was kind of more in the background. And so putting it up front in the chapters, I feel like just 
helped solidify that so much more. It completely did. I mean, I was completely, because I'd say it's not going to rain again today. There's no chance how many days it's been. I saw a lot of dead fish in my head. I was seeing, and I feel like the lake is a character in the book. And was there something that like, were you driving by a lake that inspired the lake and the idea of there not being rain for so long? Was there something that that's where I'm getting it from? Yeah. So first I, I love like setting so much and I love like the woods and the mountains and the water. And I'm just always inspired by that. Um, and when I was writing this book, I did go stay in like Lake Lore, which to me is geographically similar to the town. It is fictional Mirror Lake, but I tried to kind of stay there and take in that complete setting. Um, but I was actually inspired at the start by a few years ago, um, I was following the news when there was the drought in Lake Mead yeah. and we're suddenly, you know, things like evidence started to emerge. Um, bodies were found. Was it an accident? Was it a crime? How long they had been there? And it was kind of this question of like these mysteries that are existing around us that we don't even know about. And then right after that, I had read a story about um, a people who were doing a home renovation and they dug into their backyard and there was a car buried there and they had no idea why the previous owner wasn't around anymore. And it just kind of raised these ideas of, is there even a crime um, or why did this happen? And all those questions were sitting in my mind and I was just picturing these lakes across the country. I just kept seeing more and more articles about things like this happening, um, whether it was a car or a piece of evidence or people who hadn't been found for a really long time. Um, and it merged with this other idea I'd been having about this woman who was part of a family of police officers and law enforcement, and yet she was not. Um, and that's that's what kicked it all off. But it was very much inspired by this idea of a lake. Um, yes. So if you're not working on a book and you see something that's really cool, do you just file it? Like, do you just drop it in a folder and say, maybe, like maybe at some point, or do you have to be in the moment you're work, working on the book? I think they go into like, it is a maybe folder, but it doesn't really exist. It's like the back of my mind kind of like, I'll think, oh, that's really interesting. But it, I never feel like it's one thing that suddenly inspires an idea. It's like that merges with this other idea. And suddenly I feel like there's enough that it's a full book and not just like a, a plot point or an interesting, you know, thing in the news. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, you know, several months after that I had been thinking about this, that I kind of sent an email to my editor and agent. And I was like, I think there's something here. Um, I'm going to take a shot at it. Um, so, uh, but I try not to work on them until I'm finished with the draft, the project I need to do. Yes. Yeah. Usually at that point, it's taken enough time to like simmer and become something bigger. Well, there's so many twists in this book and they start early and they come often and they are complete surprises. Do you have those ideas first or are they coming organically? Like sometimes I know, you know what you want to do. You right. want to know what to do with the car. You want to know what you do with this. Right. But there's others, just does your imagination start playing of, wait, I can ramp this up even further if I do this? Yes, 100%. And I think that's also why I don't do the outlining beforehand, because I feel like they come from the layers that you start planting um, in the book. Like I had in my mind a couple of little twists or reveals, things that happen that are revealed very early on, actually. Um, you know, with the backstory of her family, I, I kind of had those in mind and it was writing those and then writing a car being found that suddenly gives rise to all these other possibilities I hadn't been thinking about. And then they become a twist down the line. And I like to think about it more like they're just a shift in people's perspective sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. And when I'm writing it, I do try to hold things. Um, my rule for myself as a thriller writer is like, if this information is not needed at this given point of time, the narrator wouldn't give it yet. So right. that's that's sort of how I try to to plot them out. And I'll, I'll see them falling in the Excel spreadsheet on the side, like, okay, this is going to come <laughs> coming up. Yeah. Your past career, the, the spreadsheet does come yes. in, you know, yes. it does come in. Yes. You know, we talked about, you mentioned sections, father, mother, son's daughter. Mm -hmm. And did you see the divisions? Like you said, you saw that kind of early, but was that um, 
as you're writing them, do you say, wait, oh, wait, this one's got to go in this section. This has to be in this section or this can get moved around to the others. So that for me is, is why I think, even though I don't outline, knowing that structure does really provide a huge amount of like a baby outline, if you will, because I did, I had that structure idea before I started writing at all. Um, and what it became for me was that I wanted each section to dive into not just her father, but like the other fathers in the story. And then when it's the mother, it's it's other mothers in the story as well. And the relationships that different people have with their mothers and then the sons, it's not just the sons in her family. but it, And so that provided a lot of guidance for me of, okay, these reveals are going to come in these certain sections as well. Do you know, you also write in first person in this book. Mm -hmm. And I think you do first person a lot because you've got to get inside somebody's head. What are there are the joys and the pitfalls of writing in first person because you can only see through Hazel's perspective. You can't see something the boys are seeing. You can't see something anybody on the water is seeing. They've got to tell you. Is that a hindrance or because you're inside monologue with her, it's actually an easier way to tell a story? It's both. I, I'd say for me, it's an easier way into the story because I am putting myself in one character's perspective who has a certain point of view of each of these characters as well. And I think that allows for reveals and more twists because, you know, something changes and suddenly you're reseeing everything in your past under a different framework. You know, you thought a person was like this for a reason and then you find out why, or maybe you were wrong about this one thing. Um, and it allows me, I think, to ramp up the uncertainty because she distrusts everybody um, mm -hmm. at a different point in time. And really the danger could be anywhere because I'm just in her head. I do think where the limitations come are, you know, sometimes I'll get questions like, okay, so what exactly happened here? And you're a little limited because I can say, well, I can tell you what I think happened, but Hazel does not know that with certainty. And so she can never say like with certainty, this is something that happened with this other character off screen. You're hearing it from another person or putting the pieces together, but you are only seeing what she sees and experiences. Yeah. And it's really interesting because there's moments where there are people on the water that can inform mm -hmm. her. There are people yeah. that are from her past that come over and say something that informs and you see how all those things will come right. and meld in, you know, as time goes on. But you're right, because it's the only thing she's got. You know, there's, um, Hazel's got this one message from her mother that she's hung on to. And mm -hmm. for years, she thinks about it, then it fades for years because she moves on with her life. And then she's home and she has a dream of her mother. And it's not the kind of vision she had for her before. And it's mm -hmm. the same, what you're trying to convey here, I feel, is that even with the relationship she has, there's something out there that's missing for her. And it, in part of this dream, the dream is sort of what well, the dream doesn't give the answer. Everybody, you wish the dream gave the answer. <laughs> the dream just gives her more question as what's going on, as opposed to like, I suppose her childish idea of what happened there. Now right. the adult Hazel is saying, wait, that didn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense. Exactly. You know? Yes. Yes. Because her mother left when she was 14 um, she has her entire perspective of what happened and what she was told. And, you know, she, I think, did search for her in a limited way, but she was also very upset because she was left behind. That's basically what the letter says to her. It was like, I hope one day you can forgive me. Mm -hmm. um, but what she learns as an adult suddenly changes her entire perspective of like, what did I miss when I was 14? And like wanting to go back. And suddenly I think that breaks things open in her mind, which is why she starts dreaming of different possibilities that had never occurred to her. Um, and I think that's what drives her to want to really dive back into the past and also everything that has happened and is happening in her small town, even though she put it behind her. Right. She put it behind her and now they're like, wait a second, am I really thinking the right way? There's certain mm -hmm. clues right now. They're saying, wait, you really thought that happened, but this is telling you it definitely didn't happen. That's not the way it went. And then you have to figure out what's going on. I also love that um, you have Hazel working with two friends on a rehabbing projects. So she really knows her way around a house. Like she really mm -hmm. knows 
tap this wall, knock here, go down here, what's going to happen? And I feel like uh, you have her working in that field for a reason as the mm -hmm. book goes on. But by the same token, it's also given her two friends to be in business with and to have made a life for herself outside the town, a solid okay. life outside the town. Yes. Instead of I've got to run back here. It's more like, why am I back here? And mm -hmm. what's happening? Why did I get this? She just right. doesn't get it at all. Right. Right. And I, um, I really first got that idea, really thinking about her character, um, where, you know, she's somebody who was always like, I could see the potential inside what people are capable of, or she thinks that about herself. And she says, it's the same with like homes and properties, like that's my skill. It's not necessarily the same hard skill that the other people in her business have, but it's like something intangible that, then it becomes kind of a reason like, was I brought home to take care of this house because my father knew that I'd be the one who knows the value of it? Or is there like some other reason here? Right, right. You know, what's going on? And the other two are coupling up. So now is she the third on the outside? And is she? she's feeling like, wait a second, where is my, where's my role? Where am I? I'm back in this town. I don't really want to be here yes. at all. I was coming for like a weekend. I was not coming for the rest of my life. And right. why was this given to me? Like last thing I want, especially when I've got two brothers that are calling at me or, or three brothers calling at me going, mm -hmm. no, no, no. Especially one saying it's mine. It's ours. Right. It's not yours. So right. yeah, I feel but the, the business that she's in, first of all, I find that really interesting. I me mean, too. if I wasn't I always said to my husband, I, think, I said it the other day, I said, if we weren't doing what we're doing, I really wish that we had gone into construction and we were developing homes yes. because we always come up with ideas of what to do. Like we will yeah. go look at homes being built and say, oh, I would have moved that over there. We have lots of thoughts about the open floor plan. <laughs> lots of thoughts about it. It's great when kids are young, harder when kids get older. So right. it was really funny. Like, so I said, so we'd really like to do this. And it just sits there and looks at me like, and that's what we would have done. And we both had this like moment of what the last years would have been like recession, good years, right. bad years. And you realize it's all cyclical. It's all cyclical, yeah. you know? Yep. yep. You know, there's this great line about um, that you note is that the road is around the lake and it's mm -hmm. hard to go somewhere not noticed. And I love that because you could just picture this lake and everybody drives around. So you see, if you look mm -hmm. out your window, who leaves the house, nothing's really, you know, far away. And was when there was a lake, did you have that? Like when you went over and looked mm -hmm. at that one town, that was the idea you had of the, you know, going around? Yes, it was. And there are a couple of lake communities I've been to that are like that. And I, I loved this visual of her that like, she felt like, you know, wherever she was in the town, she's spiraling closer to this basin at the center. Like you're never far from this lake that became like the center of gravity. And of course- it's this thing that she loved growing up. She's like, she's super athletic. She, you know, she can out swim her brothers. She's out on the water all the time. And then becomes also this source of terror and mystery later on and like inescapable. So I did want to have that set up of like, here's the beauty of it. You can see it wherever you are. Mm -hmm. And then later in the book, because I write thrillers, like you cannot escape this either. Right. Like everywhere you look, there's these possibilities of what exists in the surface. And it's also the water is receding. So when you go yeah. in swimming, are you going to, is there a drop off that you never knew about? Right. That's usually would be 20 feet from the end that you would never even think about. But now what is end up yep. happening? Yeah. The geography the totally changes. Well, Boats are running aground. Yep. Topography is completely different because you have no idea. There's no, yeah. um, that's the deep channel. Is that the deep right. channel anymore? Or are you swimming in the deep channel? Exactly. It was a very interesting perspective as we think about climate change, as we think about things like this, of mm -hmm. if the water does recede like it did at Lake Mead, what is on earth and what ends right. up happening? Yeah. Right. It's, and yeah. there was a, there's a town out, there's a um, reservoir, the Blue Mesa Reservoir in Colorado. Mm -hmm actually was built over a couple of towns. They had everyone evacuate the towns and they built it over it. And a couple of years ago, the lake started, the reservoir started to recede and, and underneath you could see the stop sign for the town. Oh, wow. You could see the crosswalks. And there was a book that came out last year and it was like, it, um, I think it goes a river. And when, as you're sitting there and you're thinking <laughs> about it, it's, you could actually see how people lived before as the water moved back. And because everything was like frozen in time, it's not like they took everything down because it was just going to be underneath. It's really crazy. So you've got this great line from one character about secrets. They eat at you. They destroy you from the inside out. 
Mm -hmm. And lines like that can tell you a lot more about a character than any physical description. <laughs> it can any physical and like when you're writing, are you holding back lines for that that where they're going to work, or are they always there? Because that was just you know they eat at you, they can destroy you from the inside out. Yeah. Perfect for that character at that yeah. time. Yeah, I do. I I might not see like I'm sorry, it's coughing. <laughs> um, I might not see like plot points, but I usually have sentences or ideas that I'm working towards and they feel like they go hand in hand with certain characters in certain moments and sometimes those lines themselves give rise to like what's actually going to be discovered so I do have like a document where I keep like a folder of these are things that are coming later um, and hold them for the right point and so that is something I use a lot of like there's this line I'm working towards or there's this reveal or this understanding, and there's a whole folder full of that. that that's so great. That's so great. Does writing suspense make you more or less afraid of the dark and unknown places? Because I feel like in your head, it's like, yeah. I'm in this parking lot. I've got to get to my car. There's a person standing there. And you could assume the worst or the best of them. <laughs> yes. So I would say that, first of all, I'm somebody who's already afraid of a lot of things. So I can't even say like whether it makes me more afraid or less afraid because like, the line is always there. And I think I use it sometimes, like I'll be in a situation like when I was writing The Only Survivors and a phone washed up on the beach, that fear of like, what if this was part of a crime that my family thought was so strange of me to think <laughs> became the idea. So yeah. when I was staying in Lake Lore working on this book, I was staying at an Airbnb and in the middle of the night, this light, like a motion detector light started flashing outside the window and I couldn't see anything out there. And of course, I'm the only one who's like, <laughs> something must be out there. And um, no one believed me. And then the next day, it looked like a bear had been through the garbage can, like everything was ripped off. And that, I mean, I, I put that in the book, like that plot point of, you know, it wasn't a bit, but the plot point of there's a motion detector light going off and what could it be? So I think it inspires what I write, but I don't think it makes me any less afraid. I just feel like the fear becomes more useful because I'm writing. I, you find the phone in the water and you're like, hmm, can I still yeah. dial it? What's going on? Do I bring it to the lifeguard? Do I bring it to the police? What do I do with it? And your right. husband and kids are like, just leave it on the beach. Somebody's going to yeah. you know, yeah. be back later. <laughs> yes. And so I do think story. you're flipping open to see if there are any texts in it. You know, right. is it still working? Yeah. Yep. And I think, like you said, you can see the possibility of like great things or terrifying things. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I see them all, I guess, at once. <laughs> um, and I do think like I'm able to, you know, I'm like, okay, well, this is unlikely, but I'm still going to say it and think about it. And maybe you'll use it later. <laughs> Yeah, maybe maybe this is something, but I'm not sure I want to be talking about that either right. because that's like right. way too scary. And then there are things like there's something going on with batteries and she finds the batteries thrown. Mm -hmm. And so there, there are all these little like sleights of hand actually that are going on of things are just moved a little bit. They're moved in a different mm -hmm. direction, but she's noticing what's going on. And then there are people she's trying to list to help her, like these people on the water. And of course, everyone's got a blog or everyone's got like a, a something that they're writing a piece about. And she's like, do I trust these people? Do I know what they're saying? What are they communicating to me? So every single moment, I feel like she's by herself and she goes over to her house and she's thinking somebody can help her. They're not there. Where are they? They're dead. You know what I mean? It's like, whatever's going to happen. You know? Right. Right. There's a helper, you know, gone. <laughs> yes. She very much feels isolated there, which I think just takes any setting, even if it's beautiful. And, you know, especially where she's wondering, like, who can I trust? Every possibility exists suddenly of like, and I think sometimes it's creepier that it's just, this thing has moved just slightly. You're like oh, there's yeah. not something that you can see that like, there's a danger and it's out there and I know something's wrong. It's more, everything feels just slightly wrong. Right. And I can't quite put my finger on what's happening. Right. It's like this piece of paper is just not where I left it. Mm -hmm. And those are what you do. I think you have some of the best sleight of hand out there of just yeah. moving the little pieces around. And this book, I think of the ones I've read of yours recently, this is a leap like, 
the twists, the turns, the, oh, I don't know who to trust anymore. Like, I'm not trusting. I'm not sleeping in the house with any of these people. <laughs> I, I, only if there's like no sharp objects or no weapons that right. I know about in the house. Right. And there are things that come to play that don't make any sense. And she's like, why would that be there? They never would have done that. They never right. would have done that. And yeah, at any at every moment, this poor girl just doesn't know what's going on. And she would love to go home, but then she's got this house that she has to deal with. So yeah. So how long did writing this book take? How long was it? Your usual year or more? Yeah, um, it's a little less than a year once I actually start. I think ideas, like I was saying, I was sitting in the summer and like I had these ideas and I they started to to come together in the fall, which is really when I started actively writing. And I turned the book in in the summer. Um, so, and then I did a lot of revising as well in the summer and fall after that. But it's, I, I think it's about nine months from when I like start actually working on it. But I don't generally start that until I have, you know, a lot of the concepts pulled together in my mind. Not who did it, but, you know, the different layers I'm going to be writing about. And have you run the concepts by your agent and editor to sit there and say, like, is this, enough? Is it different? Is it, because I think that one mm -hmm. of the things with thrillers and I read a lot that are the same, there really are right. the same. And this is not the same folks at all. So are you constantly like looking at that going, wait, has this been done? Do you know this? Have you read this plot? Have you heard this plot? Do you know right. this is coming? Because I know authors often fear somebody's going to write this book before mine comes out. Like something's right. going to happen before mine comes out. Are you playing around with them of like, here's the idea. Here's where I think I'm going to go before you give them what a hundred pages. Yeah, you know, I do usually talk to them both about the idea before I start it. Um, maybe like I'll send a prologue to to be like, this is the vibe of it. I feel like that's very important for my books. Like I'm pretty sure I sent the the prologue of this book is probably the first thing I sent them as well. I'm um, sure like this is how I feel it's going to open. And um, but I don't usually do it because I'm worried about other books coming out. I feel like sometimes that's inevitable. Like there's something in the air and you don't know these books are all in the works. And then suddenly a lot of you come out with like something thematically similar. And it might be because of what's on the news and like, you know, other people were seeing the same types of things on the news that I was seeing. And I think in some way you have to trust that your story that you're going to tell is different than what other people are going to tell because of what you're interested in exploring. And I knew I wanted to make this about family as the grounding mm -hmm. part of it. But I do like to run it by them. Like, does this feel like the next right book for me mm -hmm. um, in line with, you know, what I've written before and um, how I'm seeing I tell it? And then I usually after that, go away, write for a while, and we'll turn in like 50 pages. Because I feel like that's sort of the foundation of like, these are all the different layers and elements and make sure we're all on the same page. Um, and then I'll get feedback on that. And then usually I don't turn it in again until the end. Until the end, until you're absolutely, <laughs> I've got a good, really strong first draft that I'm like super happy about. Super happy yeah. about going on with this. So this is your 15th book. Yeah, I went and added that this morning. I couldn't believe I've read 15 books. You know, it's I like, said that to someone yesterday. I said, oh, and, and you know, my 15th book. And they said, really? And I was like, oh, wow, is it really? And then I had to count too. Like, I think it is. But yeah, so you're counting, I was like yeah. 15 books and yeah. they're not the same. They're not the same. We don't have the same characters. We don't have, I mean, it's all like, you know, different stories. And I find that that's really interesting because so much can be the same. If somebody writes the same vibe, writes the same this and that, and you really got to break yourself out of a box almost to sit there and say, or right, I'm going to challenge myself a little bit more with this one. And yeah. also, I think as time goes on, you, do you become more comfortable with your writing? Do you, do you trust yourself more of, I don't have to run it by somebody. I kind of trust that this is okay. Well, I think I, I trust the process a little more, like when I have like a little idea and I'm like, okay, it's not quite there yet. Like I know enough to be like, it's got to simmer a little bit more and not stress too much about, oh, no, I haven't written X amount of words for this month. You know, it's it's right. more that process is where I trust myself. And I trust myself in that. OK, I know I've been in the middle of something where I'm like, I don't know if this is all going to come together um, and not kind of panic about that. And and I've had drafts that haven't worked on the first shot. And so that's very helpful to me. Um, and I feel like I, at this stage, do have a sense of like, okay, this is going to become a book, you know, mm -hmm. like it's a big enough idea that it's going to become 
the next idea from me. Yeah. Yeah. And, or, and this one's only got these many players of it and it's not going to work. It, it's right. not going to tell. It could have worked for me at the beginning because mm -hmm. that's all I knew. But now mm -hmm. I'm realizing upping the game is really what it's all about. It's like, you know, moving it along. So and sometimes you don't want to do something too structurally similar to something I've just done, you know, or I'm thinking like how, you know, what's the right way to tell a certain story that for me is a big piece too. And you're, I like to do things that are different with each book and kind of challenge myself in that way. Yeah. And this is a very different book from the previous book than from the other books. And it's also this woman's point of view, like just going mm -hmm. in because she's got so many odds against her at the same time. I mean, she's really alone and that's what you're putting. She's got really good friends both in her hometown where, you know, where she's back to now and where she's gone to school with these other people. Mm -hmm. But it's still, there's this loneliness that starts to creep in and it's the father dying that becomes this, you know, this vast thing. And it just, the whole world kind of changes from there. Yes. And then he the therapist kind of will be coming and then we'll yeah. be, yeah, I've run, and, and, and then what happens to the author at the end? And then she went to therapy. You know, and she, yeah. I mean, she I worked, think on any other relationships. <laughs> I do. I feel like that was for her, no matter what happened, because there was so much, you know, there was upheaval and a lot of things that had happened to her in the past, but I feel like her father was the foundation for her that she felt like, oh, and he was also the foundation of the town in a way. He was this beloved detective that everybody trusted and who knew everyone and also kind of vouched for Hazel because, you know, here's this she's growing up in his shadow. And so I think without him there, it shakes every layer of her existence. Um, even though she had left before, she always felt there was a reason to come home. Um, and now everything's sort of changed for her. And it's also the boys, they've gone into law enforcement. What is over here? One's over there. And you wonder like, you know, ramifications for them of everything that ends up happening as well. So right. no, it's really, it, it's so well done. The audiobook is narrated by Inez Castillo, uh -huh. and I know you always have a hand in picking the narrator. Have you had a chance to listen to the audio at all yet? I have not listened to this audio, but um, she had actually voiced one of the characters of The Only Survivors. Oh. So um, in the flashback scenes, she had been um, Amaya's narrator. So I have had a chance to listen to her narration, but not for this book yet. So I'm excited. So the title Daughter of Mine, was that always the title? It was. And this is maybe the rare case where I came up with the title at the start. And there was a lot of conversation about like whether that was going to stay, but it was before the draft was turned in. And I just had this feeling where I was like, no, this this title is really important for the story in a lot of ways. It's, you know kind of what the, it's a letter that was left for Hazel at the start was written daughter of mine. And I felt like it just went hand in hand with the structure of the book, with her relationship with um, both her mother and her father. And so it, it stayed, but um, I think maybe only two of my titles have ever stayed. From <laughs> I remember we talked about that. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. So I'm always shocked when it makes it all the way through. Sometimes I don't even have a title on a book um until like the very end but this was one where at the start I kind of saw it and it's perfect it's yeah. perfect also the this is yellow folks look on her shelf don't look on mine this is <laughs> my, my light is too bright or something it's definitely <laughs> that and did you play around with the cover because the cover's got it's that spooky kind of cover of like what's mm -hmm. under the water I think you don't know yeah. why Yes, I saw several different um, cover iterations um, with the landscape, like, you know, and it really like, I think we all kind of gravitated toward the same ones, um, because it's so much about the geography of this place where you have the lake and they're surrounded by the mountains. And I really wanted that to be part of it. And I just love like the mist coming off of it and that you can see the evidence starting to emerge from it. Um, and then we played around with colors. Like I saw a bunch of different color ideas too, but I just love it. I think it's eerie and haunting and captures the mood and it's beautiful. And, and it's also perfect for spring. I mean, I just yeah. feel like somebody's looking for something that's not brown at this time of year. <laughs> this is like, I'm not gonna put that up there. Well, I'll drop it again. So, so, okay. I assume at this point you're into next book. You're already, okay. Idea part or writing part? Um, a writing part, writing yes. part, writing, yes. part, it's desperating. So then you will take a break to go on tour yes. and do you write on tour? 
I try to, yes. Especially when I'm in um, first draft headspace, I feel like I'm in a stage right now where like momentum is helpful. Um, but I, I also like, I, I actually try to to write on airplanes sometimes. Yeah. Um, and, and sometimes like having no distractions is really helpful too. Like, okay, I have two hours, the laptop and nothing else. Like I can just write a scene um, and come back to it later. So, but we'll see. I also like give myself permission to, you know, watch take a break, break and watch talk a break. Yeah. Tour is yeah. like a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's <laughs> it, not only just being like, you know, talking about the book and whatever, it's just getting from place to place is. Right. Oh. It's the travel anxiety. I think like, am I going to make it on time? That's yeah. Yeah. And, and like yesterday it was pouring rain in the right. Northeast. It was pouring rain all over a lot of the country and people were saying they were gone three hours delayed. Well, what does that mean? Does it mean you're right. going to get there? The tension of traveling right. and it's forget getting to the store and signing and meeting people and talking. It's just, am I going to get there? And yes. am I going to get to the My next plane going to take off? Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's the reason I like always, I always say seven hours or less I drive <laughs> because I airport, airport, yes. waiting, waiting, belt, and I always travel with too much baggage. I will never be that person with the one little carry on. No, no that's me. I'm the, I like to carry on. I like to have everything right there. Yep. It's funny because the one thing I would carry when we used to go skiing was my ski boots. Like I would get on the plane <laughs> with my ski boots because those had a perfect fit. The rest I could figure out. I could shop right. and buy. There was one time we went out West and it was spring skiing. So it had been warm the year before. So we packed like the lightest clothes, the lightest of whatever, right? And we get out there and it's cold and snowing and we are buying the same turtlenecks we own at home. Yeah. We're buying the same clothes yeah. because it wasn't like I could say to somebody, hi, could you go in my house? I'll tell you where everything is, right. pack a box and ship it out here. Right. So we right. were laughing and we're like, yeah, we have all the wrong. Stuff. Like if you could leave with the wrong things, we have them all wrong. So funny. I have the- once shipped stuff back in the middle of tour because like I kept I was like buying books you know like each stop and like my luggage just wasn't closing at the end and I got like a flat rate box at one of the stop and put like my clothes that I'd already worn in it and shipped it home I'm sure my husband was like did you just ship your dirty clothes home and you don't care what they look like you're just shoving them in the box like things have been pressed so beautifully on the way out it's just shove it in the box so it makes a weight you know yeah yeah. And then I have to find a post office on the way, like as I'm leaving town, you know, Yes, I've left things at the front desk going, can you just ship it with this FedEx number, please? And I, and I remember going, are my guy crazy? I don't even know these people. And what am I giving them? <laughs> you know? Well, I'm glad to know there is something coming next. And yes. I wish you tons and tons of luck on your tour because once the hard thing is going to be talking about this because right. you can't give much away because right from the beginning, it there's those fast. moments, including we can just give away the one that the house is hers. And it's like, that's, yep. that's a big deal, folks. And that's the only one you're getting from us today. Yep. <laughs> and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. It's always so fun.